talked a lot about kind of the broader ecosystem here in, in the Atlanta area and the uh, American Transaction Processors Coalition, the ATPC, has been an instrumental part of that. It's roughly two years old um, and it really is a good example of the public-private partnership. By show of hands, how many jobs do you think are fintech related in the greater Atlanta area? 10,000? 20,000? 30,000? 40,000? We estimate it's roughly 30,000 jobs in and around the metro Atlanta area with some extensions down to Columbus and, and other areas in the state um, are fintech driven uh, employment opportunities here. And that's really what the ATPC has been focused on. How do we keep transactionality as transactionality and all the, all the gee whiz stats as I kind of refer to them kind of growing and, and funneling through the state of Georgia. So we have a quick video on, on the ATPC and its, its contributions to the, uh, the ecosystem here. We've spent the last 18 months educating the Georgia Assembly on the importance and prominence of the industry. When we interacted initially with all our members, the, those are really the three things that keep them up at night. The over-regulation in Washington, D.C., the great need for uh, workforce development. They need IT people, they need managers, they need people with experience in, the, in this industry. Equally as important is innovation, right? Uh, there's a lot of innovation happening in California, and we think that a lot of that innovation could happen here. So we are working with the state, we are working with the uh, academic community, we are working with entities like TAG and the Metro Chamber to come up with ways to build community and connectivity between the university system, the entrepreneurial community that exists here today in Georgia, and industry. If we, uh, if we all row in the same direction as a community, um, I think we can, within the next five years, we've made it a goal uh, to grow another 10,000 jobs. But I think it's a goal we can reach if we, if we do all the things we need to do. So as we think about the next panel, it's security and compliance. I've been to lots of conferences like this and, and others. That's either a really exciting topic or a real boring topic. I think this year on how we framed it, it's super exciting. A year ago, everyone was, there was some pent up anxiety around EMV and what impact that would have, how the standard was different in the US versus the rest of the world around chip and pin versus chip and signature. Would it be kind of a wasted effort because of the advent of Apple Pay and Samsung Pay and what we'll call biometric authenticated payments? Um, so what I want you to do is lean in for this one and as we talked about earlier, Engage. Um, shameless plug, there'll be three $100 Visa gift cards given out, one for the most meaningful tweet and two others drawn at random. So lean in, we're in the afternoon session, engage and get ready to participate. Today's moderator for this topic is, we're super excited to have Joan. Joan Herbig is the CEO of Control Scan. It's a leading provider of compliance and security services, traditionally focused on small businesses. So where Home Depot and Target and Jimmy John's and some of the others that have been unfortunate victims of, of security breaches, um, there's a lots of little merchants out there that need a lot of help. They don't really understand it. And as you heard this morning, they just want to run their business. So how can we give them, uh, help them improve their security posture and their compliance posture and allow them to run their business? Jones Bennett, uh, Control Scan, in the CEO role since 2007. In addition to leading that company, she's also a leader in the industry. She sits on the board of TAG. She sits on the board of the ETA. And she's an active contributor in WNET. So with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Joan Herbig and her panel to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. We are happy to be here today. I've been involved with TAG for more years than I remember, and I came to the very first FinTech event, I think it was six or seven years ago, and certainly proud of what uh, the volunteers here have done to grow this event. 
I'm excited about our panel, and we're going to introduce them in just a minute, but I was thinking back when I was getting ready for the panel about a panel that I sat on a year ago, actually with Jason Oxman, who moderated a panel this morning. And at that time, at the beginning of 2015, we were looking back over 2014 and in the press. In fact, if you Google year of the breach, 2014 will come up. And you'll remember that in December of 2013, that really set the stage for 2014. That's when Target was breached. So we, when we're looking back on 2015, I think one of the things we can say is that our industry is not safe. We continue to be attacked day by day. And in fact, even in January of this year, you probably read about Hyatt and last week about Wendy's. So the breaches continue. And looking for safer ways to deploy security technologies in our space is something that we're all very interested in. Today, we're going to focus on three broad areas. The first area is EMV. We've talked some about EMV, maybe a lot about EMV. We certainly do it every conference I go to. And I remember that a couple of years ago, when we were thinking about the rollout, there was a lot of discussion around, will the liability shift date, which was October 1st of 2015, will that get pushed back? With the target breach, I think we all recognize that there was no way that date was going to move. The industry needed to respond, and EMV seemed like a way to demonstrate that we were serious about getting our arms around data security. So the uh, liability shift date, as I said, October 1st, 2015, we are four months, four days in, and we're going to ask our experts, where are we? Are there any unintended consequences? Are things happening that we didn't expect? Is everything on track? And is this a silver bullet, or as some cynics like to say, just another way to extract revenue out of merchants? So we'll talk about that. The next broad topic is around other initiatives in the industry that provide elevated data security. So we'll talk about a recent announcement from Visa that's getting a lot of discussion. Um, Dave Abishar is going to give us an overview on that. We'll talk about PCI, a three-letter acronym that we can't leave any conference on security and compliance without talking about. And then we'll talk about other secure technologies like point-to-point -point encryption. And the reason that the uh, this way, that way is because all of these four or three-letter acronyms result in confusion for merchants. So we're going to talk about the fact that helping merchants better understand what they need to do, particularly the small merchants, as you just heard about. And then lastly, we can't leave any discussion about data security without talking about the government. And in particular, one agency, the Federal Trade Commission, which I happen to have some experience with, has been very active recently in going after companies where they perceive their lax data security standards in place. And in fact, many now point to the FTC as a de facto regulator for data security. And as an industry, we're always trying to keep the government at bay. Um, but recently, there have been some very high profile cases. One, a company here in Atlanta called Lab LabMD, who actually took on the FTC. In the end, they won their case. But the company went out of business because they simply did not have the resources to fight this battle. We'll also talk about Wyndham, which is another high-profile case. And hopefully, at the end, you will walk away with an understanding of what you need to know about the government's involvement in this area. But before we start, uh, let's talk to our panelists. Let's get to know them a little bit. And we'll start with you, Jamal. Can you uh, please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. My name is uh, Jamal Awad. I'm the head of product delivery for Global Payments uh, and uh, we are uh, a technology payment company. We operate in uh, multiple uh, countries around the world. We service uh, merchants, partners, and a number of sales channels. Uh, my role in the organization is to, to build the products and uh, service the, uh, the merchant side of, the, of our business. Great, thank you. Sean? Uh, Sean Kiewit, Chief Technology Officer at Priority Payment Systems. We're, uh, uh, ISO, a financial products company in Alpharetta, Georgia. We have about 450 employees, and we specialize in C2B and B2B acquiring and technology. Awesome. Thank you. John Paul. 
Thank you, Joan. Uh, I'm John Paul Lesky. I'm COO of Banyan Hills Technologies. And um, just a little quick background. I just joined that company about a year ago. But my past history is I was a, a, um, in technology for 35 years at, at large corporations. And then I decided to get into uh, businesses, small businesses as, as a merchant. I own seven different businesses. And then being in the business and understanding the payment processing and understanding the security issues we were having with payment processing, I decided to open a consulting firm to address those issues. So I've been addressing and involved with the payment processing and security for now over eight years. And in Banyan Hills Technologies, we have, a, we have two divisions. One that is a consulting software engineering house that works with payment processors. And the other half works with unattended kiosks where we manage unattended kiosks and devices, including the payment uh, devices all the way through from end to end. Awesome, and John Paul, we always like having you on the panel because you represent the voice of the merchant. You're a technologist who's also been a small business owner and I think you can speak very eloquently about some of the challenges those businesses face. Well, and the fact that me. you decided to get out of that business because <laughs> it's become more and more challenging to- You're to absolutely know. right. Thank you for being here, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And lastly but not least, Mr. David Abishar. Um, so I work for this phenomenal CEO uh, here in Atlanta. Um, no, I'm privileged <laughs> to work, work on Joan's team for, uh, for the past eight plus years. And um, prior, and I, I, manage, I work with a lot of our acquirer and ISO partners. So we have 130 plus partners. Um, so from being in product strategy, which is my focus, stay very close to our customers, to the market, and keep a very broad view on things and, and how we can uh, continue to add value and educate our partners and, and the industry. Prior to that, I worked uh, at Bearing Point Consulting and their payments group and also spent uh, several years with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Awesome, very good. So we're supposed to make this exciting and interesting because it's 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we're gonna start with a question, I believe, which is, is EMV a distraction from true security concerns or an opportunity to increase security? So one of the things that we definitely know happened over the year 2015 is we spent a lot of our mind share in this industry focused on this rollout. And some believe to the uh, detriment of really advancing security. So please vote now. Was it a distraction or is it an opportunity? And before we get the results, uh, we'll talk a little bit about EMV, and I'm gonna start with you, Dave. So the October 1st deadline has passed. Where are we in terms of this rollout? Yeah, so I guess the first thing is, you know, this, this isn't a big bang endeavor. Um, I think the media really hyped it up leading up to the October deadline. And I mean, this is a journey. It's gonna take uh, a number of years to, to reach critical mass adoption. But as far as the question, you know, where are we, I think, you know, and the progress we've made, I think it depends on who you ask, but I think on balance, the industry is making measurable progress. Um, the NRF, I think, uh, at their event a couple weeks ago reported 8%, 8.5% of retailers are now EMV enabled. Um, Visa has a more optimistic data point. They just, they just um, reported last week on their earnings call. So they said 40% of their volume is now flowing through EMV enabled terminals um, and 20 20% of the actual merchant locations. So it's, it's on its way. There's definitely still a lot of uh, challenges in the industry. There's still a uh, big bottleneck in certifications. Um, some processors actually still have not enabled EMV um, downstream to their merchants. They're still working on some final testing. So there's definitely uh, still some challenges. The integrated point of sale area is one that's lacking. And also we'll get into uh, into the QSR space, um, there's a lot of apprehension there. Good, Jamal, would you like to comment a little bit about where global is in the process? Absolutely, and, uh, I, and I would definitely concur with, uh, with David, I mean, given the, uh, what we've seen in the United States, this is really no different than what we've seen, you know, based on our experience in other countries. It is definitely a journey, as, as David said. I mean, the last country was really to migrate, for example, was Canada. It took them four years. Uh, at, at the end of that migration, you know, they, uh, if you look at the goal, what EMB really wanted to accomplish as far as cutting out the counterfeit uh, and stolen cards, uh, impact out of, you know, fraud out of the system, they definitely did that. Uh, they dropped 
you know, their fraud dropped 90% out of this. Uh, so for us, really, we've had a great deal of experience uh, in this, given, you know, the multiple regions that we have done around the world. Uh, this was just a, another project, you know, for us, which it completed. Uh, we are rolling out merchants uh, at this point in time, and uh, we're getting up for, uh, you know, more merchants, you know, obviously, to come and uh, uh, software providers as well as uh, sales organizations that need to uh, get their projects done as well. Sean, from your perspective, any unintended consequences that you've seen? I, I've heard things about chargeback issues. Um, so can you comment on anything that you, you've perceived there? Yeah, from the acquirer's perspective, we've we've seen a lot of unintended consequences. I, I would highlight two uh, that are concerning to us at the moment, and they're they're relatively new. Um, the first is what we call ICB or um, internal or inside chargeback threat, and uh, I know a lot of people in the room call it something different. That's just what we call it. And and what it is is when a industry expert or someone in, with knowledge in our industry about chargeback regs, about EMV, and they uh, take their chip card and purposely find a merchant that's not chip enabled, run a transaction, and then charge it back, effectively gaming the system. Um, you know, and I had a call last week with a merchant, you know, he's like, well, like, I, got, I got this merchant, or a customer comes back every couple of weeks, buys stuff, charges it back, and I don't, you know, I've got the signature, and we're explaining to him, like, well, you gotta upgrade your equipment, and you know, I think that's the issue that we've seen is that the unintended consequences, that, that regulation was put in as a hammer to get merchants to adopt EMV, but now that the deadline's passed, now this chargeback rate is starting to rise. And so it's caused an expense for the merchant, it's caused an expense for the bank. And from our perspective, you just, we, you know, we don't turn it on a dime with equipment. You know, the, the merchant, that costs them money to retool, and so we've got this kind of flux zone where it's going to take a minute to retool, but now we've got this increase in, in fraud coming through the system. Uh, and then a second one I would I'd mention is just the education. And I know that's been talked about today, but you know I, we, we get tons of phone calls from merchants, and, and they're like, yeah, I don't need to do EMV because I'm PCI compliant. Yeah. Right? Or I'll say, or they'll be saying, I don't need to do PCI because I'm I have an EMV terminal now, and. And so the, I think that unintended consequence was this good thing of EMV security, this good thing about chip, you know, is, is causing some merchants to abandon another good thing in, in PCI. So those are two I would highlight as concerns um, going into 216. Good. Now, John Paul, you have some uh, experience in the QSR space, and I, I saw a tweet. In fact, Dave sent me a tweet last week from a Wall Street Journal reporter who said something like this chip card stuff is way too hard. I'm moving to Apple Pay. So what, what are your thoughts about EMV and the QSR space and the adoption there? Well, the adoption, Joan, in, in, in the space is, is very slow. Um, if the, only, the only way that they're changing out right now is if um, they're changing the equipment out and getting a new POS system, putting new equipment in, they'll do the investment of that. But they're also making sure that they could take the, the contact list as well as, as well as the chip. Mm -hmm. But the issue, you know, there's a couple of issues, uh, one of them being the slowness of, of, of EMV right now. And I think we all could experience it when you go in and you watch people put the card in, take it out, put it in, take it out, don't take it out. But put all that aside, okay, and let's just say it works smoothly, that the people know how to use the card. It's still 20 to 30 seconds different um, and takes longer. Now you may say, well, what's 20 to 30 seconds? So we re recently did a study on a franchisee and uh, put in an EMV terminal at a drive-through window. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the QSR business, drive-through is very important. It's a measured KPI, and, they, and that's measured every day, speed of service. And you all could relate, you know, like sitting in a drive-through, you know, more than a minute, more than two minutes, like, what's the problem? So now we put this EMV terminal in, and we're gonna test it for 30 days. Mm -hmm. So we tested it for 30 days, and we found out, based on historical transactions at that window, um, we were losing four transactions a day by using the EMV machine. And that's us taking the card from the customer and putting it in and pulling it out, okay? So you may say, oh, well, what's four transactions a day? Well, the average ticket at this, at this fast food restaurant is $6. 
Now, I don't know why they picked this, because I have never gone through a restaurant and had a $6 transaction fee, but it was $6. So if you take $6, right, times four transactions is $24. So again, some people might say, well, what's $24? Well, this franchisee owns 350 stores. That's $8,400 a day that he is potentially losing. Multiply that by 364 days a year, it's 3.057, $3.057 million a year to put EMB in. So Not how, do you, how, do you, how, do you, how many hamburgers do you have to spend to make up $3 million, right? And you say, well, it's, it's card fraud. Well, then if you look at the chargebacks, right, that Sean was mentioning about, they used to pay on an average card disputes $1,000 a month, okay? Now it went up to, and that was for 350 stores, now it went up to uh, $12,000 a month for 350 stores, which again, multiplied by 12, you're talking $144,000. He's saying, hey, I'll pay $144,000 before I'm gonna you know, worry about losing and put $3, $3 million, basically. So again, um, they're looking at other alternatives. What other technologies could we use? They know it's important, but they really don't think it's important. And they think right now that this chip and pin is a hindrance. Some of them are talking about maybe um, putting the chip and pin on a counter, but not implementing it in a drive-thru. That could be another alternative that they're looking at right now. But it's still a, it's still very interesting uh, well, project to look at, you know. I'll go to you in one second, Dave, but I do want to tell a quick story. In July, I had to buy about 35 gift cards uh, one evening for something we were doing at work, and I stopped at Walmart on my way home from work, and I, they had a, an EMV terminal, and I proceeded, well, I didn't know that when you buy gift cards, you have to buy them one at a time. Now, I've later learned I should have bought them online, but I didn't have time. I had to do it that night. So I stood in line and bought 35, did 35 transactions with my cart. And uh, that uh, process took over an hour. And the cashier was extremely frustrated because your point about pulling, waiting and pulling it out, and I kept messing up and the, you know, <laughs> blah, blah. And so um, I would say it was not, from a consumer perspective, I'm sure I'll get better at it, but uh, it's not intuitive to begin with, especially when you're used to the swipe. It just takes a little getting used to. Dave, what do, what do you want yeah, to Yeah, I just wanted to comment on John Paul's uh, point. And the brands definitely recognize this is a huge issue with the, uh, in the QSR space. And I was just chatting with a Visa executive this week, and, and I don't know how well they've marketed this yet, but they actually have a solution. And I think it's still in pilot mode, but it's kind of a way to leverage almost like the store forward concept. I think they call it quick chip. Um, it's a way to kind of trick the terminal and in any event, so it can get it down, that transaction down to something that is comparable to a MagStripe transaction. I know Visa is going to be heavily pushing that into the QSR space and trying to get adoption of that community. Hmm. Interesting. Do you guys have anything to add here? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I do concur with you on the, uh, on the speed. And again, I'm really sharing with you some of the experience that we've seen in other countries as well. I think if you really boil it down to a few things, uh, if you are building, for example, chip and older technology, yes, those types of devices, they're going to have slower processors than newer devices. If you are um, uh, looking at uh, the type of merchants that where you're, uh, you're trying to implement uh, CHIB, uh, I 100% with you. The QSRs and other you know, markets definitely were impacted with, with the slowness of the, of the transaction, but quickly adopted contactless. Uh, depending on their uh, type, you know, I mean, I'm talking about the, the major brands like you know, the, the, the McDonald's and the Wendy's and, 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 and what have you. Uh, in a drive-through situation, they also were innovative in their implementations where they you know, put in um, contactless types capability as you just, you, you know, you, you uh, uh, use your card or your, uh, your phone to, uh, to um, tab and uh, you make your purchase. Um, I mean, the reality of it is uh, there's a, you know, certain types of fraud in the market that needs to be uh, dealt with and EMV today is the international standard, if you will, to deal with that counterfeit uh, fraud at this point in time. So that's really the uh, situation with that. 
So um, one of the things I've heard, uh, a rumor that one of the major processors is now implementing non-compliance fees associated with EMV. So we, John Paul, you talked about $3 million in lost sales as a result of it. But then think about fees that are being imposed, uh, processors seeing this as yet another opportunity to squeeze the merchant. Sean, what do you, do you believe that? Or what's your philosophy around that? I've heard that, we're not doing that, but um, I have heard something different. I just heard this, we found this this week was, um, instead of non-compliance, we've seen compliance fees from equipment manufacturers and app providers. So this would be the equivalent of the, you know, like an app uh, on, a, on a hardware device, whether it's a terminal or whatever. Normally when we, in the past, we just, we buy it, right? Pay, pay a couple hundred bucks for a terminal, drop it on the counter, and that's it, but they, um, they're basically coming back saying, no, we're, we're gonna charge you maintenance on that, you know, maybe 50 cents to a dollar a month because we have to keep the terminal certified. We've got to, you know, we've, it, it takes effort to certify all this stuff and keep it mm -hmm. um, in right form. And so we've, got, we've seen that coming across, so that could impact processors. I wouldn't um, put it past processors to make it a money center. It's certainly not our objective, but um, that's, that's interesting. Okay. One other point, Joan, uh, there's another issue when we're talking about merchants, but I, wanna, I just want to share uh, something about unattended kiosks, mm -hmm. uh, the issues that we're having with unattended kiosks, because you go up and if you notice now, you go to the airports and all the vending machines, right, have, have terminals on, and a lot of them are putting EMV in. And, um, but when it comes to a rental machine, like a DVD rental machine, when you put that, key, when you put that card in first, it's recognizing you as card present. The second time though, but, but if you went, Joan, and rented a movie, and you put the card in, you take it home, and you forgot about it, and you didn't return it in a couple of days, right? They wanna, re they wanna go and they wanna get a recurring charge on it, mm -hmm. right? So, so now, the kiosk owner, they will go back and they will try to charge card not present. Ah. If they're not accepting a card not present, that person's losing money. Mm -hmm. I have a customer who has, who has um, has 100 kiosks and has lost $89,000 because they couldn't get, do that second or third transaction because of EMV. So until everybody adapts to it, there's another hole in the system that we have to start looking at. Good, so let's talk about the, the topic of the mind share and how much time and energy we spent last year and even the year before thinking about this rollout. Are we beyond that? Are you guys able to think about things beyond this in terms of secure technologies as we go into 16? No, I, I would say 2015 was the year of the terminal. Um, you know, merchants basically swapping out terminals for EMV compliant terminals. But I think 2016 is gonna be largely VAR uh, ISV markets. Uh, they, for the most part, haven't upgraded. And so I do think you'll see a lot of that in 2016 where they're pushing through, uh, you know, on a, either unattended or they're doing uh, pay the table, things like that. So I would imagine it's gonna take a little bit more of our time to get it, get it rolled out. Yeah, we, uh, absolutely. I mean, we're just uh, starting at David's uh, point. Um, the, you know, this is a journey. It will take some time for the market to terminalize. And I think if you look at the uh, merchant segment, the, we need to look at it in the you know the uh, the smaller merchants who are today will be upgrading you know in a easier fashion in the sense that you swap that device with an EMV capable uh, you know device and they get a nice shiny ter you know terminal that does Apple Pay or contactless. But there's also the large merchants as well that you know own their equipment, their own their software. That definitely you know uh, those projects are going to be uh, uh, bigger. And in 2016, um, I mean, we're also thinking about the uh, oil and gas uh, market, the petroleum whose liability shift happens in 2017. So we, you know, those, uh, that segment of the market, they're also gonna be, you know, preparing for that liability shift and the work that uh, comes along uh, with it as well. So we will see more deployment to, you know, to happen both on the card side and on the, uh, on the terminal side. Good. All right, well, let's see how the audience responded to the question. And it looks like most people, not most people, but 60% see EMV as an opportunity, while uh, right around 40 see it as a distraction. So I don't know. I'm not overly surprised by those results. Are you guys? Mm, no. 
All right. Well, we're going to talk now. We're going to change, turn from EMV and talk a little bit about other initiatives that are underway, um, because we all know EMV is not a silver bullet. So there are other things as an industry we're working on. There was a, a very interesting bulletin that came out that's uh, causing a little bit of turmoil. And I'll turn to my uh, the smart guy on the control scan team to give us a little bit of an overview on this visa bulletin. Sure, Joan. So in late October, uh, Visa issued a bulletin around small merchant security program updates. And there's three parts to the announcement. Um, one is that they are requiring, as of January 31st of 2017, level four merchants, which are represent 97 or so percent of all merchants out there. Um, it's, it's based on uh, transaction count. So as of January of next year, they're going to have to validate compliance. Um, everyone's had to be compliant for a number of years, but it's always been up to the acquirer whether they choose to enforce validation on those merchants. So as of January, they will. The second part of the announcement was they're extending their TIP, their Technology Innovation Program, which is an incentive to recognize the um, the, the efforts being made by merchants to adopt secure pay, pay, payment technologies. So if you adopt point-to-point -point encryption or EMV, if 75% or more of your transactions are flowing through EMV-enabled uh, equipment, then you could be eligible for a uh, waiver of PCI validation. And then the third part, which has probably got the, the industry in the most um, you know, really challenge to figure out how to dutifully implement or adhere to the requirements is around QIR, which is uh, an acronym that the PCI Council has, a qualified integrator reseller. So these are the individuals or the companies that are going out and implementing point of sale software, um, these, these systems you see common in, in restaurants in the retail space. So this has been a big gap in the industry um, because the vast majority, uh, Visa says over 85% of the breaches um, have happened around insecure implementations of point of sale software or insecure maintenance of them. So Visa is trying to bring these integrators who no one really has a good handle on in the industry. The acquirers typically don't have visibility into who merchants are working with to implement this software. Um, it, they haven't been on Visa's registered list of service providers. So this is an effort to kind of self-regulate. Visa acknowledges that this is a gap in the marketplace and they're gonna require as of January of next year for the level four merchants to use only validated certified integrators, resellers to do installation and maintenance of their point of sale. So that's a big deal. Why is that a hard problem for the merchants? Well, for one, anytime you ask merchants, these level four merchants, and certainly uh, all three of these gentlemen can, can speak to this firsthand, but you know, they, they're gonna look at your QIR like you have 10 heads. They don't, they don't typically you know, even know often who's doing maintenance on an ongoing basis with theirs. So, so there's a challenge in just education um, with these small merchants. And then there's also a big challenge with having an, uh, available an, uh, the, the, the uh, critical mass of these certified professionals to go out and do this work. No one knows how many of these there are that are out there. You know, there's currently 72 for the whole, whole for global. This is a PCI Council maintains a list of certified. So globally, there's only 72 certified as of right now. Um, there's speculation. Sounds like a big business opportunity. If anybody in the audience is looking for a business opportunity, it sounds like QIRs might be it. Also sounds like the PCI Council has a way to make a little bit of money training and certifying these people. So the cynic might say that there's an angle there, but I don't want to get into that, do we, Dave? Um, no. So um, Sean and Jamal, uh, do you guys have any reaction to this visa bulletin? Does it affect your business? Uh, yes, absolutely, it, it, it does. I mean, there, I mean, it puts a lot of onus on us on the education side, and 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 there's really a lot for the small merchant. There's a lot coming at them when you really look at all of this that, that's happening. I mean, these guys, you know, they have a store. They want to service a customer. They want to make sure that transaction is is you know is safe. They're really not thinking, you know, about an EMV or a TIB program from Visa. 
that's not really what what they uh, you know what they do. So there's there's a there's a, a huge level of, of uh, responsibility on us and really effort to uh, first of all educate those particular merchants, and then handle those merchants. Uh, based on the type of business that they're also working with. If you're a small merchant, we obviously, the owners and ourselves, to demystify all of that technology for them to say, you know what, here's a, 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 a you know, piece of equipment that addresses and, and complies with you know, those, those rules. But mm -hmm. if you're a large merchant, of course, uh, yes, they do need you know, to adhere to the, to the same uh, type of uh, you know, compliance. But of course, there's, you know, the, the role there changes beyond the education, it's the specifications, it's help, it's consultant, consulting work that we need to do uh, uh, for them. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, any merchant would want to be in a position where their environment is a safe harbor environment, protects the, the, the consumer uh, you know, at the end. That's really what they're, what they're looking for. And, and I see it really a responsibility of ours in, in the industry to help them out and make sure that they you know, comply. Uh, as for the TIB program itself, uh, this is a visa program. So the equivalent of MasterCard and, you know, and, and Amex, obviously, is, is not here uh, either. Uh, so the onus, while we register those merchants when we comply with the spirit of the uh, visa program, we still have to deal with the MasterCard and the, uh, and the uh, Amex uh, and the Discover uh, rules as well. So any thoughts, uh, Sean, from your perspective on how merchants are going to react to this? You mentioned the fact that they're confused about, you know, does, if I use EMV, am I PCI compliant? I, I saw a tweet about that actually a couple of days ago from one of our partners who said their merchants were confused about that. And you've talked a lot about education being important. So how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. <clears throat> it's a big problem. Um, and our industry doesn't help our industry when you know we have well-meaning sales reps that sell an EMV terminal telling our merchants that they don't have to be PCI, right? And so there's a lot of it that we kind of harm ourselves. Um, so actually Visa making this announcement and tying PCI and actually using a carrot to say if you use 70 or 75% of the transactions go through EMV, you don't have to validate PCI, sort of makes you think they're somehow related. That's right, and, and I do think our merchants are very hungry for a, a silver bullet, as you call it. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, I, and I would say we've reached a point of saturation in, in our industry with our merchants where, you know, 10 years ago it's PCI, and PCI will make you secure and put you in safe harbor, and then, okay, so I'm secure. Now I need, now you're telling me I have to have EMV. Well, why? I'm, I'm PCI secure. Well, okay, now let's do EMV. Well, <laughs> EMV's not enough. We have to have P2PE on top of EMV, and, you know, we have these, you know, the merchants really at this point are saturated with, look, I don't, just figure it out. Give me a solution that works and I don't have to do all this stuff. So, you know, I really hope our industry takes that seriously and develops a product that, you know, provides that availability and stability and security for our merchants. That said, educating our merchants happens every day and it's, it's you know, explaining to them, and Jamal hit it right on the head, they don't, they really don't care. They want to do their business. They want to run their, their shops. But obviously when they get breached, it comes back to the bank. And so it's in our best interest. We have to work together to get merchants um, educated on the program, but also give them product sets that l lowers the burden of, of education. All right, John Paul. Well, as a merchant and, and being in the technology business, I've been pushing, I've been an advocate of, of saying there needs to be more certification and education. And I kind of applaud the, the, the QIR document, although I don't think it's enough. I don't think we're going far enough. And the reason I say that is, is that, you know, we talk about EMV cards, and if you look at how all the breaches were these last couple of years, they're, they're not from necessarily from the card machine. They're getting in back doors. So when you look as a merchant and you go out and you have a, a vendor that you hire that comes out and they put in a POS system into your, into your store, and that customer or that vendor had to be PADSS compliant, their, their application to put it in, so they come in and they install it. And as you talk about the merchants, they don't understand it, they just want it to work. And they say, oh, I'm compliant, good. I don't have anything to worry about, okay? 
But what people are, have to start to realize is based on this internet of things and all these devices now connecting to their stores. So, for an example, if you put in a security system, the store is gonna say, I need a security system. Well, that comes in and it's hooked up to what? The internet, which is connected to your router. And it's, now you have a broadband connection for your security system, which is tied to the POS. Then somebody might come in and say they wanna put a kiosk in their store, or they wanna put an energy management in their store. But all of the devices today, as you know, and you could relate to this as a consumer, uh, just like in business, they all plug into the internet. So now what happens is that who is managing all of that for that merchant? They're not compliant anymore. Who's doing the administration? Who's doing the network segmentation? Who's making sure that the security cameras are segmented off the network? Who's, who's doing all of that? So under this QIR, right, for the certification, these vendors should have that ability to do that. But then who's gonna manage it on an ongoing basis? I think managed service providers need to get more involved with it. Or, and because I see a lot of merchants going, like you said, I just want this taken care of. You know, I'll pay $100 a month, just make it go away. And so I applaud this effort, but we have to continue to push that because it's more than just swiping a card or EMV. It's the whole operational package of operating and making that business secure. Yep. One of the um, questions that we often think about is what happens with PCI? So the fact that um, you put point-to-point -point encryption technologies in place and your validation requirements are lessened and we also see, and you'll, you'll talk about, I'm sure, in some of the cases with the FTC, they're now pointing to the PCI DSS as the baseline standard. So PCI served a great purpose in our industry and it continues to get more refined and certainly better. But what happens to it over time? Anybody want to opine on that? I'd be happy to okay. start and please jump in. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the PCI standard will continue to evolve to reflect the, the risk landscape. Um, I think there's going to be, as, as the car brands continue their push for dynamic data, I think Utopia is when every transaction in every channel is dynamically authenticated. So that data is therefore uh, completely devalued and cannot be replayed through any other channel. I think that's the Utopia. I don't know that we'll see that in our, our lifetime. But um, I think there's certainly progress being made um, for sure. So I think the, the, the standard will continue to evolve. I think there'll be a heavier concentration on those that are holding that data, whether it's token providers or, um, or others, or that are, as we get that, that toxic data out of the merchant environment is ultimately the goal. Um, so I think that the PCI as a, as a consortium will continue to stay relevant for the foreseeable future just in, in different shapes and forms. Anybody else? You know, I, I don't know if, you know, there would be a day where the PCI will go. I kind of, you know, the analogy, I, you know, I, when I look at it, it's like uh, you're really healthy, but you got to go to the doctor to, to get that check, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to make sure that you are. So even when you secure uh, through multiple means that we're talking about here, somehow you need to know that you are still, you know, secured and, and you know, whether it's a, through a, a PCI scan or making sure you don't have any uh, intrusions into your networks or uh, your technology is secure. So that's really how I view it. I really don't know if it will go away, um, but hopefully you will get less intrusive along the way. Probably not in our lifetime, yeah. right? So I'm gonna turn now to um, the government because I love to talk about the government. And we have a, a um, question for the audience. Should the government have a department responsible for overseeing data security standards? Yes or no? Should the government have a department responsible for overseeing data security standards? And while you're answering that question, let's talk a little bit about the FTC and some of the recent cases. Dave, give us a quick overview on that. Sure, so I mean, the FTC has been very interested in this uh, kind of being the de facto regulatory uh, body or police of, of data security from the perspective of 
you know, they view it as it's damage to, to the consumer, and they view it as it's deception if you're out there saying that you've got in your privacy policy or terms of use that you're properly safeguarding the data, blah, blah, blah. So they have been very interested um, to establish that, that role. And most recently, there's been a couple big cases. Joan mentioned uh, LabMD, which is just a, actually a very small company here in Atlanta that um, it, the guy definitely has turned you know, lemons into lemonade. He's out on the speaking circuit sp talking about his experience. And um, you know, he, he did win. I think there's actually an appeal by the FTC, so it's not completely closed yet, but uh, all, all indications suggest that he'll be, he'll be okay. But he, he did sink his business. Um, so the Wyndham case is another one. That was a highly contested case for, for several years. Wyndham uh, really pushed back. At the end of the day, they lost that. So as Joan said, that is the first time um, where they've actually, in their, um, in the settlement, they've, they referenced PCI. And so they've got a, a number of years where they need to comply to an audit. They also established um, reporting requirements on the franchisees, which is the first time they've done that, which is gonna be very onerous for them. So it's a big deal. Um, they clearly, they even issued a press release reaffirming their role as the, the police for data security. And that's one of the roles that ETA is playing, lobbying on the Hill to make sure that the voice of the business is heard um, while um, the counterbalance is the FTC looking after the consumer, presumably. So any thoughts on the FTC's involvement, government's involvement, and, and how that impacts how you think about helping your merchants? All right, I'll, I'll give it a try. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, so when you're dealing with organized crime, you know, the, the logic says, well, you know, it's, I think we should have some organized way uh, from the industry to, you know, to combat this and have an organized method to, to, to deal with it. I'm not really so sure if the, the, it's the government or body or someone within the ecosystem that's close to this is, you know, is, is, should be uh, the, the voice of this organization, if you will. We've seen government intervention uh, in other places around the world, uh, Asia Pacific being one. I think the un unintended consequences in that situation ended up being, um, you know, the payment system added is, is complex enough and adding additional complexities and penalties just made it even more complex. So I'm not really sure if the government has a role in this. Let's see what the audience says while we're at it. And Eve, <laughs> well, we'll wait. Sean, do you want to comment while we're waiting for the audience? Did anyone <laughs> respond? Sure, I, mean, I, I think no. that Jamel is exactly right. I think our industry has to, to have a leadership role in security. I think PCI has been great. You know, it has highlighted a lot of things that has, you know, that we, we have to know um, as security practitioners of how you run secure shops, how you do things. So it's a great, in my mind, a great tool for our industry. It has to keep evolving, though. Um, you know, I think, you know, maybe it surprised everyone in the room that merchants lie on the SAQ. You know, it happens <laughs> all the time. And Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we're in this weird situation now where, you know, we're kind of put in harm's way as the bank. So if I agree that the merchant says they're PCI compliant now, that merchant's making an attestation of their security, right? And so if they get breached, mm -hmm. whose fault was that, right? So I'm, do I, am I culpable? Am I, do I have something there? And I think that's where FTC, that was real interesting on the Wyndham case, was they're saying something very specific, that you, you're representing that you're secure, you're representing that you've got a policy and you do all these different things. And it turns out you, you got breached. So you couldn't have been both. Now we know that that's, that's, that's a very slippery slope because the attackers are just far ahead of the defenses right now. So you, know, you can have a situation where you, you check all the boxes but still get put into a legal, um, legal environment that the FTC is on top of you and they have unlimited resources and funds. So, you know, it's something that we've, we've been watching and we have to take it, it seriously. Um, but I do, I do think I would, I'd prefer to have our own governance as opposed to our federal government. 
Well, you do know the Office of Personnel Management was breached, and that's a government that. agency, 20 million records, 5 million fingerprints, so they're not necessarily... Um, How many uh, breaches had the government had yeah, this year? Exa exactly. <laughs> John Paul, last word on that? Before. I was just going to say how many breaches has the government had this year? Yeah. Okay, and you know, it, I, when I get their house in order, then I'll, maybe I'll think about it. <laughs> Very good. Well, the audience tends to agree. Um, looks like most of the people believe that there should not be a department or agency focused on overseeing data security. So um, as we close out here, I'd like to ask one final question, and that is if you could offer for the audience uh, some one thing that they should take away from our discussion today, what would it be, Dave? Well, what I would say is just maybe everyone in this room is, is, is obviously more well informed of, of our space and, and the movement toward secure technologies and the chip and all that. So I think everyone in here, not just from where they sit professionally, but just personally, could all help move the industry forward just by educating your neighbors, educating the cashier. You know, there's a lot of concern about these wallets, these, uh, these different mobile wallets, which uh, if you really you know, look under the hood, they're very, very vastly more secure than, than an actual card. So that's all I would just suggest is that encourage everyone to play a role in, in helping move the industry forward. Good, John Paul? I would say, you know, learn the technology. Just delve into it, understand it. Put yourself in an emergency position. Understand how much money they make. You know, their margins are small. They're trying to run a business. You know, we're applying different fees, but try to get educated on and looking at it from their perspective and then educate them, help them. And I think we'll all be in a better place. Sean? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the merchants are our lifeblood. We, you know, they're our customer. And, you know, when they speak to us, they're telling us the same story over and over again is, hey, I, I run, I'm trying to run a business and you're making it harder. Um, you know, and I want to be secure, and I don't want my customers to be harmed, but at the same time, I, I only have so much cash flow, I only have so much time in the day. So I, I totally agree. By training people, and you know, education is the power to change the world, and it can change our world for our merchants. And if we can, you know, stop selling things that aren't real, stop selling things that, you know, don't solve problems, the industry, uh, we all win. I, I mean, I would say if you are a merchant, if you are a software developer, if you, uh, if you need help, lean on your acquirer. This is what we're here for. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, we're supposed to be helping you. We're supposed to be making it easier for you. Um, and if there's any other time that you, you, know, you need help, this is it. So uh, absolutely, lean on your acquirer. Let, let them help you. Great. Well, we are at the end of the panel, and I think we are running a little bit over. So if you have any questions for the panelists, we'll be around after. And we, um, I want to ask for a round of applause for these experts. And uh, thank you all very much.